So moving on now, I'm going to be reciting the our speaker's um, citation in person of um, Dr. Um, Kainia Debi. David said he doesn't want us to call him doctor, but um, apologies, we'll have to do that. Thank you so much for that. Um, about our speaker, Kainia Adebi is a doctoral scholar at Indiana University, Bloomington, where he's pursuing a PhD in microbiology. He was a founding scholar of the Nigeria University of Technology and Management, where he was engaged in interdisciplinary studies and innovation for African development. He is the national director of campuses for SDGs Act Nigeria. With over four years of experience, he leads and coordinates all campus SDGs advocacy groups in Nigeria. He is also a Education USA OFP scholar. Kendi holds a first class bachelor's degree in microbiology from the Lagos State University. He is a recipient of numerous local and international scholarships, such as the Ghanif Fawaini Jega Foundation and 15 healthcare scholarships. In fact, in 2020, Kendi was the program coordinator for the Millennium Campus Network. He coordinated over 1,400 civic leaders across 20 nations that participated in the class of 2020 United Nations Millennium Fellowship. In June 2020, Kendi won the Union Bank Rise Challenge Award for his invaluable contributions in helping others rise during the COVID-19 pandemic. He was also nominated as one of the 100 beaten for not heroes in Africa by the Future Festival. He is also a fellow of the Young African Leadership Initiative, YALI. Kainde also served as the 2020 Youth Lead Ambassadors. As 2020 Youth Lead Ambassadors Peer Advisor, where he supervised selected civic leaders across the globe, a project sponsored by USAID. Kainde co authored a book titled Nature Face Vengeance, which has helped undergraduates live a successful campus life. He is immensely passionate about sustainable development and desires to see a planet where everyone lives in peace and shared prosperity. So, this is our um, speaker. I'm going to like um, be welcoming him on board properly now. Um, Dr. Adebi Kende, if you can hear us, um, we want to specially thank you for accepting our invitation to be our guest speaker for today. We know definitely that this is going to be insightful and lots more. We, we are here to get educated. We are here to learn. So right about now, sir, you have the floor. You may unmute yourself and take us on the right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I can see someone sharing screen. It would be nice if we can stop sharing. It's really an honor to be here today. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I would first say sincere gratitude to the organizers. And also for Peter, I would give it up to Peter because he tried reaching out to me so, several times across to him. And I'm so sorry for, uh, about that, Peter. It's an opportunity to be here for a couple of reasons. Like from understanding about OAU stars, it's an aggregation of scholars. And this brings me back, it's a nostalgic feeling for me, for, for first day. And when I was in my second year, I started a call that was my second year in the university, in Lagos State University. Uh, I started a call called Incipient Scholar School. With an ultimate goal of ensuring that, like, you know, best students across campuses come together and, you know, they do stuff like this. Unfortunately, the, the club didn't last the test of time because of some of a couple other things. But to see that it's going live in uh, Bafemeolo University, like it's not like I shared this idea with anyone before. And so that like, you know, you guys are reasoning together that when there's a question of best minds, we can achieve success. I think it's absolutely phenomenal and fascinating. Aside from that, before I move into the context of today's discussion, is that the idea of creating a scholars forum is not to segregate or to discriminate. I'd argue that the idea of creating a scholars forum is firstly for its advancement of its members. That is, individuals in the group do not come down from that scholar's grade. At least, for example, if the first class from 4.5 out of 5 is that's what your, your school uses, 
Or also, the second ultimate goal is to ensure that there's more recruit into the group. It's not a cult group. It's not that you don't want people to join. The idea is to help people that are struggling, stragglers, people that are the FS class, but even two, one, two, two students, to be at the central point of offering tutorials to the university community and ensuring that you produce more greater scholars. I would argue that as a first class student, as a scholar, if you are excited that the university produces just a first class in a year, I I'd say that like that's not a good way to think about it. You should be able to work with a mindset that if the university produced 10 first class students last year, we should support the community so that they can produce even 100 the following year. Because it does a very common adage, the sky is too large for everyone to fly. And the success of other people is also the success of the university, of the group, and also of the country at large. And I just thought I would share those remarks. But I'm here to address a very interesting topic, which is winning uh, you know, application. And I've been asked to address uh, overcoming application sector, winning scholarships rather, the overcoming application sector. And it's pretty cool to speak about scholarships because scholarship itself is beyond money that people think about, beyond financial aid. And that's the first thing I'm going to justify in, in, in this session. And feel free to ask questions. I tend to also speak fast, but I'll try my best to slow things down. But feel free to drop me a message in the chat box if you have an immediate question. I'm happy to take questions after this session. Um, the concept of scholarship, you know, transcend getting financial aid for money. The concept of scholarship transcend getting grants. Traveling abroad, you know, the old Japa syndrome that we have now in the country for a couple of reasons. Scholarship itself stands at the center as the forefront of advancing knowledge, basic research, you know, ensuring that people of gifted talents, of immense curiosity, of capable ones, people that are ready to be trained, are brought into a particular fold, supported to advance wow. knowledge. I, I think that is very, very important. Now, okay, but I'm going to and I would, uh, I would appreciate maybe one of the calls can also uh, maybe meet some persons if they want to. But yeah, so as I was saying, the concept of scholarship lies in knowledge transfer, knowledge generation, answering the no questions. It lies in the central front of curiosity and development of humanity. So whenever you think about scholarship, is your mindset just about getting money? For example, an undergrad, my mindset about scholarship is just getting the MTN scholarship. You know, is your mindset about getting, leaving the country? That is not the fundamental purpose of scholarship. Okay. All other things that comes around it, the grants you get, the money you get, you get to travel to another country, they actually complement the central purpose of scholarship, which is capacity building, knowledge advancement, and the betterment of humanity. I think these are three things we all need to know. A typical example, a PhD student is in school to get degree, but more importantly, they're also doing research to advance knowledge. Never forget these two things. However, this thing is not possible because resources are needed. And such resources include the funds, the place where you do research. And that is why as human beings, these are some of the things that entice us. So keeping the first part of my discussion is that before I speak about application process itself, I have divided this talk into two parts. And I'm sorry, I, I really intended to make a slide, but I don't have the time. But I hope you can you know, listen to me and get you know, one or two things I can say, and I'll be saying here. Is that I've divided this session into two basic sections. The first is the pre-application phase, and the second part is the application phase. I know majority of persons would want me to say things like how do you write an SOP? How do you write an SOP? How do you, you know, have a very good CV? And I'm going to touch base on some of those things. That itself is an entire section. But I've learned over the years, having mentored hundreds of people in scholarship area, and having also go through scholarship process, having gotten several rejections and also numerous acceptance. I've learned that one of the fundamental parts of application is not the application season itself. It's not even the application packet itself. It is the pre-application phase. What goes on behind the scene? What happens before the application starts? And I think this is a very good audience because majority of people here are undergraduate students of Robert Femmeal University, meaning that you are not ready to apply for scholarships yet, not until when maybe you're in your final year when you graduated. So you are in a very, very good stage of hearing this talk. And even for those that have graduated, like you can start your pre-application phase now. And what that mean by pre-application phase? I'll talk about this whole concept of pre-application phase also in, two, in different segments. The first is the part of capacity building. While I've explained a lot of things about what scholarship is, as I said again, knowledge transfer, curiosity, generating yeah. knowledge, contributing to the body of knowledge. One thing I failed to mention then was that scholarship is highly competitive. It also comes with competition. That is, 
I wish there's a world where everybody that is curious for research, everybody that is curious to advance their knowledge, I wish we have a world in which everybody can just get the opportunity whenever they do. I wish we have a system, even a system in Nigeria where I do not need to travel to the US to pursue my interest in scientific research because of lack of resources and you know, funds. I wish that was the world we have. But that is just living in an in the, that is thinking of the ideal world. For those that are science students, you know the concept between you know real gas equation and ideal gas equation. And for those that are in philosophy, we have the concept of realism and idealism. Yeah, the ideal thing should be like people should be able to, you know, be able to come into research, come into scholarship, to come into knowledge anytime they want. There should be funds all the time. But that is not the way it is in the real world, even here in the United States of America, which is one of the most developed countries in the world. So it's highly competitive. Which brings a more fundamental question, is that what sets you apart? So the pre-application phase, the first thing you have to ask yourself is capacity building. Look at yourself from head to toe. Am I a competitive applicant? It's not in mere words. Whatever you have on your CV, is it just mere lies or mere embellishment? Because I've seen that happen over the years. Are you just, you know, you know let's say you attended this seminar, for example, and this is great, this is fantastic, a fantastic seminar. But are you writing in your CV, that you attended a, a very rigorous workshop that is posted in the practice of application rights in there by teaching rights. But of us know that is incorrect. But are you the part that truly really go through some major process that even what is in your CV is a perfect reflection, even though at least we're not even saying enough because of lack of space. You don't want to have too much of the skill set you have. So the first thing is capacity building. And how do you put capacity? One thing to ask is interest. Do you have your interest? You're a microbiology student, you're a philosophy student, you're an engineering student. Do you know where your interest lies? Do you know what the sub area you want to learn? The first part of capacity building for undergrad is very simple, your grades. And I'm happy that I'm speaking to scholars in the university community. Your grades, your grades should be top notch, should be exceptional. I had a mindset in my undergrad, and that mindset is, I do, whenever I fail, it means I have a B. Like, it's just in my head. That because from the day the semester begins, from my first year to my final year, my ultimate goal is to get A's in all the courses. And that's why we check undergrad transcripts in all sheer sense of humility. I don't have a C. I've never had this before. I don't even know how it looks like. It was difficult. And you know, there are a few questions I have to be, and I feel so sad. Even sometimes, even tears come out of my eyes. Some courses that maybe I make some stupid mistake. It's a standard. Not saying that maybe having a C once in a while is out of your. Now, you know, it's cool. Your transcript is fine. If you're a first class student. I do tell people that attending first class is not by mistake. It can never be by mistake. It means you have to have at least 70% A's in all your four-year or five-year course or six years course to be a first class student. So it can't be by mistake if your school truly works through. Obviously, there's no behind the scenes, just I believe that same for you. So what the first thing I want to say is that you need to work a model of capacity building. And as undergrad, you need to have a very good grade, like a very good grade. Now, I've seen people give up over time. If you're a first year, this stock is quite, you know, spot on for you. Start from the first get go, read as much as you can. And I can go into a section of academic excellence, but that's not what I'm asked to speak about here. We can go into how do you maintain good grades or how do you surmount the difficulties, how do you do all of that? But the central message of all of that activity is and diligence. And intelligence entails hard work. You need to work very hard, proper planning and organization. I do tell people this, and it's that to me, it's one of the bizarre things, which is that. I think I'm, I can read very fast. I can understand things within a group of an eyes whenever I read. So let's say exam is in two weeks. I can take the whole course semester in two weeks and maybe still have considerably a B on A. But I never do that. From the day the semester begins, from the day we're having classes, when I was an undergrad, is the day I'm reading each topic, even reading ahead for the next topic, because of the course at line. Going to the library to read more, much more than what I was taught. I was not deceived by the illusion that I can read this thing very fast in a matter of two weeks or three weeks. And to be honest, I think that's a bit correct. And I should still have a bit. Like, I can't even fail it. It's not possible. Maybe I'll have a C. But one thing I knew that, like, even with talents, hard work is necessary. And I've seen hard work win over talents a million times. That is, even if you have to read 10 times, you don't need to be like Kenny that can read within a twinkle of an eyes. If you have to read 10 times to get to success, A. If you have to read just once to get to A, the end goal that matters. Both of you are first class graduates, both of you are A. So hard work and diligence is important. For me, it's an irony to see students that are struggling, that will take them maybe a month to read, to see them that they are mostly the one that starts reading the day to the exam. And to see this very smart, intelligent person is the one reading three months to exam. That irony, I don't know why we have it, I cannot understand. But 
What I'm saying is that for those in undergrad, you want to take your grade serious. So it's the first part of the pre-application phase, having a good grade. One thing that people tend to make mistakes, let's say your first three years, you know, your grade is not really good. And you're in your last semester of school. You're in your final semester, you're in your last year. Even that last one year grade, that last one year, you can take it serious. It means your beginning can be today. Forget the past. There's no need to regret it. I wrote a book that actually dropped this video. my citation was right. And the chapter one was the beginning. And one of the statements, and I'm quoting myself here, I said was that the beginning is always today. You can start now. And who tells a story? You know, who decides the beginning of a story? The narrator, the person narrating the story, the narrator decides the beginning of the story. And I've seen practical cases in scholarship application. Where there's someone on two, two for the first TV, you know, maybe first TV semester or maybe the first, second, third year. And the final year shows to do so well, maybe have a five point or four point five, a very good set of ways. I'm making a case in the statement of purpose. That yeah, I agree I was struggling in my first TV years, but I've been fundamentally motivated to, you know, to attain academic success, as you can see in my last year academic results. And I've seen just such persons with scholarship. The essence of this conversation that is not too late to be great, to good grades. What if you've graduated? And I'm, because I know there are one of few graduates, people that have graduated that joined this because I also prepared my class. What if you graduated? And you don't have a good grade, you have a two and a two, so even a third class. It's not over. There's something we call great complementary you know, mechanisms vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, taking some online courses, taking some diploma courses, ensuring you have attained enough academic excellence that can complement it. But what is advice that if you are still in college, the first thing you want to do is to have good grades. So that's the first part of the application phase, which is the capacity building having good grades. The second part is recognizing your fundamental interests. You know, for masters and PhD, but well in scholarship, there are usually areas you have to narrow into. So you can't say, oh, because we did a bachelor's in English, you want to go and do a master's in English. You have to have a center of research interest, a specific field you are interested in. Now, from undergrad, particularly in your third year, you should kind of try to figure this out a bit. It is okay to change later on. It is fine if you change it. But just have an idea, and you want to dedicate your time to what is done beyond the university system. I'd say that we are at a time in the world where we are blessed with the greatest resources to attain you know, absolutely phenomenal success. Also, we have a time in the world where we can become, you know, a nemesis. You know, quoting the word of one of my mentors and someone I respect so much, His Excellency Professor Yemi Oshibadu, the former vice president of the country, he said that, you know, Africa would either be the word nemesis, you know, or savior. Three things would decide. One, leadership. Two, leadership. Three, leadership. And in this concept of leadership, I'm talking about leading yourself. You know, even lead the own leadership of the political system. We have a world where there is Google. We have a world where actually everybody has a telephone, a mobile device. I, I just graduated not quite long, just about four to five years ago. But even my first two years of college, I didn't have an internet mobile device because I could not afford it. But things are a bit proliferated now. You have Google, your master sheets, you have so many online courses. So you want to build yourself beyond what is done in the classroom. You want to read more. You want to take online courses. You want to contribute to research. Even though there may be limitations, to carry out some research, for example, like science studies. You can write review papers. You can go into workshop and trainings. Just Google it. You see a ton of things you can learn, a lot of things you can learn. That's a way of capacity building, such that when you graduate, you don't want to just be a main graduate of the certificates given to you by OEU. You. you want to graduate with the fact that, like, you understand what is happening in the world. You actually research. It's unfortunate that the Nigerian curriculum has not really been revised so badly. And even if the curriculum is revised, you know, if the curriculum is revised, we see some of our lecturers that tends to not to teach the updated stuff. And that is, that is so sad, but that should not be a limitation to you or for you. Just go online. You see a lot of things. Go to YouTube videos. For science students, I've learned that there's hardly any protocol ever that is not on YouTube. You see it. You see animations of it. You understand it. You would certainly understand it. It's impossible not to. The animations are so simplistic. But we don't know this. We say that oh, we don't have the equipment. I've not seen how it's not before. So you can build yourself such that you yourself know you know this thing to access it. And that's a part of capacity building. And you will be like, why am I not talking about scholarship application itself? Because everything I want to see afterwards is part of it's useless. If there's capacity, if there's nothing to present, if you are not competitive, I would say that you can be competitive, you can be distinguished, you can have success, you can know your stuff and still not win scholarship. And that's why we speak about the application phase very soon. So that's the whole first part of this whole concept, the application phase. I'll start down. You know, in the application phase, getting a community of like minds. You know, a community of people that really want to do this, people that want to apply for scholarship, people that want to succeed, people that want to get scholarships. 
I've learned over the years that opportunities when shared together, you know, or when when you have opportunities, when you can attain a lot of success. And you can almost get that trade community, a community of like mind, people that also pushes you, people that you are accountable to. When I was not that guy, I had five set of friends, six of us actually. And uh, it's very interesting. All the six of us, we have the group chat. It is not what I had wished for, but all of us are not in the country. You know, we have four of us. We currently pushing the PhD. One is in the UK, you know, even part of the presidential envoy of the Kingdom of Congo, of the Republic of Congo, rather. And we all started with from upper beginnings, but we are so committed to success. And the association, sometimes when I'm failing, they encourage me. You know, when they are failing, I encourage them. I also have a twin brother. Uh, his name is Tyo. He's currently in the University of Houston doing a PhD in artificial intelligence. So if you imagine, uh, I have someone that lives with me almost every day that you know encourages me, check on me, and I, I'm accountable to such individuals. So you want to have a community, somebody that you know you have like mind, like interest, and also know both of you are, are, are motivated. Now, once you've set all of this, these are part of capacity building. <clears throat> then I would argue that you can win a scholarship. There's no question about it. The question is how, and I'm going to the application phase. This is what I think most people here want to hear about. Now. But the first part, I usually say, takes 70% of the whole work to win a scholarship. What I just said now, or capacity building, having distinctive success, you know, having some papers published if you can, having some research experience, having some extracurriculars. Now you need to know your capacity. Thank God I remember that. When I was in college, I did a lot of extracurricular work. I started the first SDG club on campus, you know. And you can see from my citation, even though I'm a biologist, I did a lot of UN work. And by starting the first SD campus club, I started to do passion, and I, I can't share more on that because I'm not talking about service to humanity. But I've, I learned a lot of skills, one of which is public speaking, you know, good writing. As a scientist, I was not taught that at all. I was taught scientific writing, but maybe not writing publicly. Organization, project management, leadership. And interestingly enough, it was one of my extracurricular experiences, you know, having led thousands of students in messages across 20 universities. I got my first job after I got, my first job was United Nations when I graduated, United Nations Academic Impact. And it was really interesting because I, I never imagined it. But then there was COVID-19 pandemic. I was home. I was just applying online and I, I got the job. So, and I did that for some for some time before I got scholarship to UTN. So it means that those things really matters. And these are some of my core strength dream application phase. Now, yes, I'm not only a body microbiologist with interest, as you can see in my publications. I also have a lot of diverse perspective and knowledge about leadership, and I bring on board a great sense of diversity, understanding of how the view world works, to help, you know, protect the university in a good light. When I'm applying, I apply for Shevlin, I won the Shevlin Scholarship Award, and that's the most competitive award in the world after the Rose Scholarship. But I argue that it's not my first class that gave me Shevlin. It's all my extracurricular work. It was a lot of work, I wouldn't lie. You know, some sleepless nights. Also, it doesn't mean you should be doing everything. Also know your threshold. I have friends that are doing so well, they can only do one extra curriculum. I did about four. They know that if they do more than two to affect their primary responsibility, the academic stuff. Very, very, once that has been affected, I don't care what you are doing, you know, even be it fellowship, you know, I, I do not see, I, I was the, maybe please make, make your feel better. I saw that we started an opening prayer. I was the academic coordinator of the whole Christian community in last week. So I, I in course, some people call me pastor. I don't think I'm a pastor. Though. But so, it doesn't mean you cannot serve God, but I do tell them, and I because I was I, I ensure that no program on campus, there's no program you want to do that more than two hours in church. I, I do even tell the president then, like, why are you doing a three hours meeting when it's not Sunday? Why are you doing two or three hours service? Like, what are you doing? Students should study and read. Because the fellowship also should not be a stopping block to your primary to success. God is number one, nobody's questioning that. But you are in school. If the person is expelled from school due to academic misconduct or maybe not passing grade, they can't even be a member of the fellowship. It's just basic logical reasoning to me. There can be few exceptions to program unless you have fasting and prayer for PBDs. That's fine. But not consistently taking 10 hours from people or 20 hours from people and not letting them focus on their academic study. I was a worker, so I was able to juggle all of these things very well. I go to work as I know it takes time. But once it's affecting your study, I'm, I'm telling you authoritatively and hope you can listen. If you see that you cannot juggle your workers as a fellowship member in church and you cannot do it academically, leave the worker stuff, just be a regular member. Go back to your study. And if you can do both of them, that's fine. Create a balance. Because you, you always have God for the rest of your life. God is always number one. You know, even going to your study doesn't mean you're not going to church, doesn't mean you're not faithful. Even if you're a Muslim, doesn't mean you're not doing MSSN stuff, whatever it is. But you should not compromise your fundamental purpose, you know, which you wish you are in college for. 
So that's the first part of it. Before I move on to the core part of the application, I know I've seen a lot of things. I really hope that you guys, you know, are enjoying the process. I would just love some reactions in the chat, but if you guys are with me, uh, if you guys are with me, I would love to see reactions in the chat, but, you know, if there are one or two nuggets you got out of this first part of the section, if I can some reactions in. Oh, that's good. Now, how do we apply for scholarship? Thank you so much for the comments itself. I guess that's what everybody wants. Scholarship is interesting, but the first thing I try to do is what we call data tag. <laughs> you can miss it and you may not miss it. And by data, data, the data gathering gets uh, comes community. And I, and I alluded to that in my previous part of the presentation. And, um, oh yeah, thanks for the insight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the comment I did on, on and by data gathering means that then you look at it. Let's say I've graduated from college, I'm a fan of it. I want to do a PhD in microbiology. The first thing I do is mentorship. I reach out to people that have done it before. And how do I do this? I go to LinkedIn, for example, and search. I speak to colleagues and friends. I join some scholarship group. Some of them are redundant. At first, I was doing a lot of things because I don't have any information. I don't know anything. And it makes me feel better. In my final year, I applied to, for scholarship. I had a terrific grade. At least, I would say, I did the 4.85, you know, that has not been recorded in my departments before. When I was in last week, I published a book. I've won about six scholarships. I had about four publications. While I was saying all of this is, there's no reason why I should not get a scholarship. I did apply the first year when I was about graduating. Everything was rejected. Everything was rejection. And there are people that were too, and I got scholarship. But, you know, looking back in time, I wouldn't mind giving myself scholarship with what I submitted. Now, that's why I said, even though capacity building is good, and I think I have that, that's a good percent. The last 30% of the process, I don't know anything about it. I didn't have mentorship. I just went and applied. I wrote it like, you know, the way I can. I put a lot of hard work, but I was working in the wrong way. You know, the way I constructed my CV was not necessarily the way it should be. The way I told my story, and I can even share the experience. I remember telling my story that like, oh, despite the challenges in Nigeria, I spoke about a lot of challenges in infrastructure. I still was able to do this research, do that research, do this research. I learned later that even though I had success, I was telling the actual community that like I came from a place where <laughs> my training is questionable. You know, there are a lot of challenges. You know, I could maybe subtly mention them, but that should not have been the focus of my. I remember that was the focus of my SOP. Oh, paragraph, you know, explaining the Nigeria institution and how I was able to navigate myself. And that is my real story. But then again. You could imagine when I'm coming from people all over the world, people from Harvard, from Stanford, if you are the admission committee chair, yeah, you feel for me, you acknowledge my success, but rather take someone that you know that you are not here to repair whatever the challenges they've gone through. And I'm, these are merit based scholarship, most of them. So, yeah, this, and this is me sharing my mistake. I got rejection, you know, like big rejections. It was very painful. Then I also had to borrow money to apply, I paid for the application fee. I didn't know that there was something called application fee waiver. So the first thing you want to do, so like, <laughs> you want community mentorship. You know, reach out to people on LinkedIn. That's what I did after I graduated. I reached out to people, attend sessions like this, and I'm glad you are in these sections. And what do you do is that like, this will give you power of mentorship. And by mentorship, it makes you know that like, oh, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. Yes, I was having breakfast, I can tell I saw your comments. Reach out to people, both people related in your field or not in your field. Some of them will not reply. I would like to have about close to 2,000 shares in my LinkedIn. Sometimes I open them, but I can. I'm also a PhD candidate. I'm doing research. I work for like 14 to 15 hours. So it's impossible. I reply to some of them. Some people are consistent. And I even wish I could reply to everyone, but I, I just can't do it. I'm sure before you reach out to about 10 to 15 persons, you will see one person that will reply or two. And also depending on how you position yourself, you don't want to ask for too much. You want to be strategic about it. I see some people message me with I. Ah, I don't know you from anywhere. Or hello, sir. You think your sir will make me reply you like I will not start conversation. Okay, hello. They don't say, How are you? I'm fine. How are you? So you, you think like the people in Dublin doesn't have that goes of time. We are not also being friends. Very simple. It's a simple note I can give you. You saw someone you're interested in, you have their email or their LinkedIn or whatever place. Hello, my name is Kendi Alibi. I'm a recent graduate of Obafemi University. I'm a final year student. I'm very much interested in research in the area of epidemiology. And I've gone through your prof profile. It's very fascinating. I read your work in this. It's so spot on. 
I really hope for mentorship because I also want to follow the same step you followed. I've attached here my CV that details some of my experiences, and I would love your comments and I would love to follow you on it. A reasonable someone like, like at least someone that is reasonable, they would, they would, they would mostly reply you when they see, except they didn't see. I can't touch it because Because not only have you spoken a little bit about me, you, 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 you research what I'm doing, you presented your best foot forward that this is what I am, this is what I've done, but I need your mentorship. I know this is not enough. So you need that guidance. You need, you need it. I think that's the first part in the application process. So if, if, if that makes sense. So once you have the mentorship, but now let's imagine that all of you had, you reached out to me successfully and like Peter did. As a mentor, what will I tell my mentee? Let's say you reached out to me and this is where I'm moving to the application phase. The first thing I usually do is to create a graduate school sheet. Start searching for lift of schools. So what I do most times is go to, you can, the first point is go to LinkedIn. You don't have an idea of, Let's say I'm interested in a master's in entrepreneurship or master's in sustainable development in the US. Let's go to master's graduate students in sustainable development in the USA. LinkedIn will give you a lot of people. And LinkedIn algorithm is so interesting because it will bring people, the Nigerian international students to you. So you can see where people are. And start creating lists of schools. Have, a, have, an, have, an, have an Excel sheet, create a list of schools. About 20 or 30, or even 50. You can't apply to everything, you will still be filtering it out. And I'll tell you how you do that. Once you have a list of schools, the first one is go to the website. So just don't type, let's say you have a school like University of Pittsburgh. Just don't, don't go to Google and type University of Pittsburgh. Like maybe like even in Nigeria, but yeah, university website is so large, like you cannot go through everything. So just narrow it down. You can say this like University of Pittsburgh Masters in Entrepreneurship Program. It will take you directly to the site where that is offered, the departmental site. And once you do that, um, you then try to read for the requirements. So what I do in the Google sheet I have, or the Excel sheets, I use a Google sheet because everything can be online. I can so I have the name of the school. I have yeah. the link part of the requirements. I, go back again. You know, I have the requirements so that the documents needed to have to take any exam. I have the section of the application fee. For those that need to get maybe supervisors or advisors, I have like two or three professors that I check on the website, the names, and their link there, their emails also, that may be interested in. I have the part of the application fee. Do they give a waiver? If yes, can I email? And I also have a part of contact person, maybe the program coordinator for the program. So I have this whole broad Excel sheet. It's one line of school. It's all the information I need in one's position. Now imagine having that with about 30 or 40 schools. Just in a single document. It takes hard work. It may take you two weeks. It may take a month. You know, because something not. But after I've done the first two schools, you get used to how you get information. You have these master sheets. I call it the master sheets document. Everything you need is there. Then you start getting to work. The first phase of work is starting to filter things. Do you think your interest there aligns? Do you think you stand a chance? You know, do you think your CV aligns with what they are looking for based on their requirements? You know, you want to do that. You want to also email the program coordinator. Hey, I'm trying to apply to this program. Can you guys grant application fee waivers? Um, I'm in Nigeria. The exchange rate is a lot. All of those things. A very cute email. And, you know, this one is session for email, right? I would have gone deep into that. You want to do that. They start ticking boxes of some school that give you fee waivers. Some may not give you, but you are really interested in applying. You also tick them. So you may, I use color coding to filter them. You also filter based on those you think that your CV is a strong position to apply. You know, to the next thing you want to then do is look at what is the general trend in the requirements. And one of the general trends you would see is one: the world requires statement of purpose or personal status. The world requires CV. The world requires transfer. They will require letter of recommendations. That's general trend. So you want to bring out that general trend. They want to go for the specific requirements. Some will require writing samples. Some may give you some questions to answer that others didn't ask. So you have the specific things. So the first thing you want to do is to work on the major requirements that is trending to all of them. And let's say you filter from 40 to about 10 schools now. You want to work on the major requirements, starting from your SOP. And I won't go deep into what an SOP looks like. It's a whole section of how to run an SOP. But you want to attend session on how to run an SOP. You want to like, you know, see samples online. There are so many MIT, Stanford, Harvard, IU, SOP. Even Nigerian, a lot of Nigerian people are doing this on Twitter too, where you see sample of SOPs. You want to write an SOP, give it to people to edit within your peers first. You don't want to send your first via a mentor. Remember a mentor that you met, that you reached out to, either on LinkedIn, that may be big PhD student in quotes, or that big person that eventually wants to edit your work when you are ready. You don't want to send your first job to them. 
Do you want them to, because you have your colleague, just your friend, send it, let them correct. Send to maybe another top person, maybe it's, maybe you are in your final year, maybe someone that just grabbed it, that you still have rapport with. If you think you've gone through like, like give you four drafts, then send it to that big person. It means you've not sent your first fundamental mistake. The weird thing is, though, even once you think I've gone through four drafts, it's likely that the person you send to may have to start again. They have their visas. Is that like it prevents some mistakes that are just redundant that maybe even come frustrating to the mentor at times. So you want to go, we call I call it an iterative process, an iterative process mm -hmm. over and over again until you have that masterpiece. So you have your documents, also your CV. There are so many CV templates there. Which one works best for you? You know, you can ask your mentor for a template, you can check online. Design it. The CV will be so easy to design. You know why people have difficulty in having CV? Because they failed from the first thing I spoke about, the capacity building. Imagine someone like you. You have some publications already, or you have some improvements, you have research, you have a good grade, you know, you've taken some online courses, you don't, did some extracurriculars. You'll be the one struggling to fit your CV in two pages. You'll be like most people, some persons that work with that, to even have one page, you will see them, they'll be describing. I wish if this session were not recorded, I would have sh shared my CV on the screen, but it would be a problem because I can't do it. So, you know, you see some of them, they'll be describing this experience and they will describe, they will have like five bullet points because they want the open to because they don't have another experience, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate. And you can, all this digital experience in college is very, very important. So, so if you can work on capacity building, you can have a very good CV. Give it to your colleague to check. We are trained again, send it to your mentor. And also do say, regarding letter of recommendations, I think one of the major reasons why students also do not get scholarship is letter of recommendations. And, it's very powerful, particularly in the US. I know, like, they believe that if someone can attend, and you submit like TV for PhD or two for master's application, you want to have a very good letter of recommendation that is specific to you. Letter of recommendation says that, like, my name is Professor Blah, 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 and I'm, I'm recommending Kendi Adebi. He's an hardworking, diligent fellow that has worked with me, and I hardly recommend him. Generic. What does hardworking, diligent fellow mean? You all are scholars. There's something we call case studies, you know? You know, you know, a letter that goes like this, you know, I am Dr. This from the Department of Microbiology, and I write this letter to strongly recommend Kendi Adibi for his application for a PhD program in microbiology in institution. Kendi has been a long research student that has been hardworking, working with me on several occasions, and I will like some examples in the subsequent paragraph. Next paragraph, in 2018, I met Kendi in a research lab, and he shared his interest in whatever topic it is. He singularly we work with the team to collect some samples, did this just one case study? The next phase, you know, we've one case study and justify your academic excellence. The other case study is just by maybe your sense, your soft skills. The other paragraph, that like if you beyond know, these academic and technical skills, is someone that can work in a group, you know, particularly kind of able to recruit new persons. Specific examples, specific individual will be looking at it. You know, it can be a whole full page, yeah. And that is sometimes one of the half pages, it depends. Specific examples, the question that should not be generic. And how will you achieve this? Now, professors are busy, right? They are very busy. And uh, and I know how the job professor can be like, yes, you know, even talk to them can be so difficult. If you've done a very good job in undergrad, you create relationship with some of them. You don't want to wait for when you need them okay, to then reach out to them. You want to kind of check in. If you have like three or four, I have like five persons because you may need three. May have two professors. It doesn't mean to be a professor, assistant, or lecturer. It just doesn't matter, to be honest. It doesn't matter. As far as they're an academic institution. And you can have maybe a professional person. I usually have two academic persons and one person from my professional experience. You can also have to be academic. That's fine if you don't have any other professional experience. Try to reach out to them. Help them with stuff once in a while. Now, this is the part of where you understand culture. For a place like the US, you don't need to be helping your professor with things where they give you a relevant. They will give you if they know they're a good student. But I know the country I came from. I know the culture. I'm, I'm not a lambasty. You know, people are very busy. We are, we are very big on respect, very big on like, you know, reward, reward based system. So you want to be like, oh, yeah, you know, these people will be en enthusiastic to give you. Once they, send, once they agree, send them a draft because you won't see what they submit. But by sending them a draft of the way I describe it, read online, a very detailed draft, they will mostly just edit it and they will submit it. Otherwise, they will just go to their laptop, look for one sample, and change your name. I've seen so many instances where the school have received the same recommendation that from different applicants with just the date changed. And it's unfortunate. So you want to kind of send you know, drafts and, and let things go that way. And that's for the part of recommendation letter. 
A lot of things you need is transcripts. I'm sorry, it should not be so, you know, in a working system where you have to wait for transcript for a month or two months. Again, understand the system. Um, I listened to you know, one of my favorite person I listen to is Apple Sujusha Selma. He says to change the system, we must understand how the system works eh? and kind of live in the system and try to make it change. None of, you have, none of us are vice chancellors now, so we can't really change transcripts, getting transcripts in a week or two the same way it should be. You know your transcript in your school takes three months, four months. Apply it out like five months before. You know, just give time. You don't want to be boxed up with that because you are delayed with transcripts. Here what you need to readily available. Now, for specific questions, you can answer them. Another thing I can speak about for those interested in research, you want to email professors in school, stick to instruction. You'll see it. Some school will say you need to get a professor before you can apply. Some doesn't matter. It's fine for those that doesn't matter. You can email and try to get some contact. But for those that says you need, and in fact, emailing, nobody answered you. Do not apply there. You're just wasting your time when they've said that specifically. When they said that specifically. So you want to kind of follow instructions. As I said earlier, the topic I'm asked to address is an overwhelming amount of topic. You know, talking about the recognition that can be a whole section on its own, about SOP can be a whole section, the CV. But one thing I have been able to tell you, because I want to give you for question, is the application phase is a vigorous process. It's a marathon. I see that as a year process. And no one can fail, but we'll I have to try again. I tried twice, and I got numerous scholarships. I've told you why I failed. I was ignorant, not because I don't have capacity to build. But it starts, the summary of this talk is simple. You have to build capacity. Whatever stage you are in, is never too late. 100 level, 200, 300, 400. Graduate students, having graduated, graduated already, it's never too late to change your story. HND doesn't matter. Two to third class doesn't matter again if you graduated. It means you have to do more work. You have to take more online courses, take some other diplomas to help you scale your CV. But you can build capacity. But do not build capacity for paper alone. Build capacity to know. You want to be so sure that this is what your CV says and you can defend it to an extent. And even when you move to a new country, there will be challenges. You will be as if you are not intelligent at all. You will be justifying your mind that at least as far as what your country was able to offer and what you can get from the internet, you have a grasp of it. Within a matter of a month or two, you balance with the new country. That's a fact. So build capacity. The second part is seek mentorship. That's the role of mentorship cannot be overwritten. It's impossible. You know, and ask and also know that mentors are human beings. They also have their time, they are dealing with. You know, they may have gone through your own state, they have their challenges. Also respect them. Don't be too, don't overburden them. You know, review yourself and send to them. Your first, you know, session with them, your first reaching out to them should be okay. Don't get angry if anybody didn't reply. You try again, follow up, if not, find another person. As I said earlier, I wish I can reply everybody on my LinkedIn, but I can't. It's, it's impossible, except I would die. And I really wish so, but I reply some, some of them that I think is very consistent and you know, the mode of reaching out is very convincing. You know, try to do that. Also try to also show that you've done some research yourself. Be organized. And that's the essence of the old, when I shared about the old bullshit. Be organized. You know, have a good system of organization. You can't always put things in your brain. Have timeline, deadline for yourselves. Application process December 1st for some school. Target that like by, you know, September, October, you have your packet. November, you're just iterating and you want to submit by mid-November. Don't wait to get up the deadline. It's not a good practice. I, I did that in some application and I regretted it. And also, know that rejection is normal. Like, some reasons why you didn't get clash is not because they are not enough. One, is very competitive. Two, they are limited resources. Three, they may not be taken, you know, in your area of research interest. That's why I said the larger your sample size, the better your opportunity. For those of you that know probability in mathematics, the larger the sample size, the larger the possibility of satiety. And so, apply to a lot of schools. I mean, it's money issues, right? That's why you want to start early, you know? You want to start early. You want to ensure that you get fee waivers. I got about, I applied to about 10 schools. I got about six fee waivers. And I was able to, you know, edu I was an education USA member. So the US embassy actually funded my application. And sometimes, some rejections cannot be explained. If you put in your best, you've done everything, you've followed everything Kenny said, and rejections take comfort. Yes, life can be tough. I've passed through those phases. I remember when I was in college, I was invited by the UN for a program. I got funding. I went to the embassy for US visa. And I was rejected on the fact that, like, my university cannot pay my flight ticket. My university was ready to pay, but the consular didn't believe so that why would my university pay? I could not imagine it. It took a lot of effort to get there. I was rejected by the US visa then. But yeah, I was on my own. I moved on. It was painful for some days. I moved on with life. I had exam the next week, and I moved on. 
The irony of it is when I was applying to graduate school, I became an education USC web scholar. Not only did the embassy pay for all of my application fees, they paid for my flight ticket. When I was waiting for my visa interview, I didn't have to go to the normal routine, like I was invited to come. I could see these are people that literally rejected me, and I still contact them to date. And even when I was coming to the US, they gave me some pocket money to hold. The ton of life, right? Then the reason why they rejected me is not logical at all. Like I can't even understand that. I think they're the most critique. So rejection sometimes cannot be explained. But one thing that can be explained is not giving up. Huh? It is hard, I agree. But you have to have just one option. No matter how depressed you may be, no matter how indecisive it may be, you can do it. The last thing I can say is that, like, I don't know where you started from. I don't know whatever it is you are going through. I came from a very, very poor background, you know. Like, I live in Bayer good government from the greatest level of poverty. And, and that's why I started SDGs, supporting, you know, sustainable development. What I can tell you that, like, you can be a product of your decision, not a product of your circumstances. And it's been an honor speaking to all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Thank you deeply. Like it was awesome all through. It was indeed insightful, informative, educative, and whatnot. Um, we've learned to have direction. We've learned that understanding oneself is very, very important. We've learned about the great um uh, complementary law. We've learned to recognize our fundamental interests as actually important, like when we are deciding what scholarship to actually apply for. So we've learned about the importance of capacity building. We've learned about um, extracurricular activities and um, their relevance to scholarship application. We've learned about mentorship, mentorship as um, an important element to how far we can actually go in life. I mean, you don't just, you don't just want to go into something. There are some people who have been there that you can actually like, um, get something from that enriched knowledge. So we've learned so much there. Um, and um, of course, you said um, it's important to approach people in the most diligent ways. We've learned a lot, but just as so you expected, we are all you stars and we shine wherever we, 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 wherever we are, wherever we go to. So um, there will be this question definitely for you. And I can see from the comment section, um, people are already dropping some questions. So please, this is what we're going to do now. Our speaker is still right here with us to answer all your questions. You can just do well to um, raise your hand. The moment you raise your hand, I'm going to call your name, then you will mute yourself to speak to, to all of us. And this is to avoid um, rowdiness. You know, we have uh, we have the traffic on this particular session. So sir, in one of the questions dropped in the chat box is um, how did you build positive relationship with your lecturers in your undergraduate? I am currently in my second year. So um, somebody dropped that. I think um, the person is talking now, Spar, letter of recommendation and all. So um, um, maybe we should just um, take five questions at a row, then I'll still have to attend to that, then we'll go, we'll go to the next. So let me, let me see, um, I have some hands raised here. Adoza, you can unmute yourself and say something, ask your question. Are those are you there? If we are in, yes, unmute yourself and ask your question. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah, good evening. If you are you are very well connected. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Mr. Kinde, um, Dr. Kinde, sorry. Um, I really appreciate your time with us today. It was very, very insightful. So um, if I want to ask a question, I just wanted to share just a little light on what do you think are the specifics that actually makes us stand out in the pre-application phase and also in the application phase? Okay, thank you so much for your question. In FAI, what are the specifications that can actually make us stand out in our application? Are those that you've been raising your hand, can you please unmute yourself and say something else? Adosa, are you there? Okay. Off by Dio, you can unmute yourself and say something. Okay. 
sorry for shining right. me for those that can show their face it would be great like i look like i'm just looking at right. myself <laughs> okay let me try <laughs> Yeah, it's only fine if you cannot I understand sometimes there may be electricity issue in Nigeria. <laughs> okay, please go on. Let's have your question. All right, so my question is simple, especially for all right, is this for art and social sciences students and let's say humanities generally? Uh, I know Ken is from the sciences, so I'm not, I don't know if you can say it, but let me see ask is that in terms of uh, especially learning about your college, I mean, your publication, your, your academic publication as an undergrad, it's, it's impressive and like knowing about it for a while now, it has always been amazing and surprising somebody like me. So now the question is for, for, for students that are not of the sciences, what are they like approaches or what, what approach can you say they can take towards having like academic publications and undergraduates or with the same approach work for whether you're in the sciences or not? Okay, thank you so much, Okwedayo. Um, for people who are not in science um, faculty, faculty of science precisely, is there a different approach to their own, to their own stores? Actually, I, I, I personally had that conversation with a friend who insisted that um, the fact that um, the faculty that it, it comes from is not, you know, is not actually, um, is not actually open or to opportunities. I don't know the way he particularly put it that time, but he said, okay, coming from faculty of education now, um, they are not, they are not almost I don't know, but he said it in some kind of way like, okay, opportunities are always available for people from tech, people from science, if you worry about education, or about most times, if you want to, let's say you want to do masters abroad, you might do something like international policy, you might do something like, it's hardly for you to feel like, okay, enroll for a master in education, something. So yeah, adding to the question that um, um, offered that you just had, I'm just putting it out there. So the next one, are those that you still open you were still raising your hand. Please, can you admit yourself and put and put your question out here? Okay. Adosa said, currently, I'm sub, I'm a serving pop member. I have my HND and in distribution. Sorry, let me just go to the chat so I can see perfectly. Okay, currently I'm a serving pop member. I have HND with distinction. I wish to go for my master. Please advise me on the process to undergo. Okay. We have another question from Abdukari Mohammed. How do one become a member of Education USA? So putting that to our speaker now, we have another question. How do one become a member of Education USA? Um, let me see. Anybody still raising hands? So that I will. Uh, okay. Are those that already read out your question? So, um, as speaker, Dr. Kenya Debi, you may unmute yourself and um, help us do justice to the available question we have. I think I would so yeah. much prefer it if you guys can come in, Ken, to be honest. And I really hope you guys can do that. And moreover, I'm a doctor. I'm still in my PhD process, but I really appreciate Ken, even if I'm a doctor. I really do. Um, but to the questions, these are very nice questions, actually, and it's so nice to hear them. And thank you so much for. Uh, the compliment also. The first question is, what are the specific things need to stand out? <laughs> Very interesting question. The first thing I can say, the first number is grades. If you can have a good grade habit. Like good grades always help. I think one of the surest way, at least I can see for me and for all of my friends, for someone that doesn't know anybody, okay? one of the surest way. The other ways, though, I have to be honest with this, there are tons of other legal ways. One of the surest ways for someone that knows nobody to become somebody that can connect another person is education. And that comes, you know, having good grades and also being learned. It's, 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 it's kind of taking places, even how to utilize it very well. Another thing that can make you stand out is I've seen so many first class students graduate. They're like, they know stocks, they know their specific stuff, but the academic world can be rigid at times and cannot communicate, cannot translate to the world. And that's why little involvement in extracurriculars can teach you some skills 
communication, managing people, managing relationship, networking. Those things are very essential. And it's also show forth in your application processes. So it can stand out in you know, having a very balanced effect, a very good exceptional academic grade, I have to be honest. If you don't have that, you can complement it with you know, you know, having some publications. And regarding publications, somebody also asked that. You know, uh, you don't need to see, even our professors are not doing groundbreaking research. Don't let anybody deceive you. We don't have the resources for groundbreaking research. So you can give millions of dollars for writing science. But you can do a typical thing. Somebody is just sciences. You know, we are in a world where I get it wants to publish in a peer review journal. And what I dispute, you know, what if we cannot do that? If in a world where just your ordinary article publication in Medium Daily Digest, where it's free, you can publish them. Even a LinkedIn article can be in your CV. There's yeah, someone interested, for example, let's say you are interested in human resource management. And you then you, you, you study the current dynamics. Let's say I'm interested, I want to apply the master's in my resource and I want to write a paper. Let's go practice now. I look at the current dynamics. Major topics going on in the community are one, artificial intelligence. Two, totally for Nigeria, influence of economic inflation and economic scale, hmm. and I'm in human resources. There's nothing stopping you, is that analyzing the cooperation of artificial intelligence you know, to in human resources in Africa. What do you have to do is download a bunch of journals on artificial intelligence, know what it's all about, download a bunch of things on how technology has been cooperated in human resources, download a bunch of journals on what are the challenges facing technological implementation in human resources? Connect the dots, bring new insights, which other people have not brought out. And these are the challenges. This is AI. This is what AI threatens for Africa. This is the opportunity it gives. Publish that. If you can have a peer review journal, if you can collaborate, that is fantastic. You can even write. If it's only a LinkedIn article, if it's a medium page that is a medium article, it's cute. It's like, they don't ask you see, I think we should also see scholarship the wrong way. Scholarship is not work, it's not employment where they expect you to come with some established expertise. Scholarship is training. You want to come and be trained and produce knowledge. But what they want to see is that you have the capacity to be trained. You have some previous experience. And just by even publishing in some of these small journals, doing some very good job, the best way you can, it's enough side to show that, yes, you are, you are someone they can invest in. You are someone they can train. You are someone that will show up with. So, and also for science people, you can write, you know, there are some research you cannot do, even for those in engineering or even microbiology like myself. We do not even know how to extract DNA. We cannot even clone anything. You can start, you are interested in antimicrobial resistance, infectious diseases. Do some basic analysis. You can even do some primary data work on, for example, the old human resources thing I cited. If I'm a human resource specialist and I want to really do a good research that required primary data, I can just set out a Google form or like have people that are already working in companies asking their opinion is their HR you know, responding to changing economy tides? And you can publish an article on, you know, reflection and effect of Asia management in the current Nigeria economic landscape. It's, it's not as easy as I say it is, but like, these are ideas. Like, it's research, right? Any questions can be answered. As far as you're also curious for the knowledge, you know, even though the central goal is for you to technically become a better person, you know, to get a scholarship, but also curiosity also matters because you're curious about the answer. So I think it's possible. We just take a lot of intentionality, working with the right side of people, and also asking questions where you don't have to do it. The third thing is for HND people. Yeah. No, the other question is that, like, for people in social science, you can get scholarships. I would argue that the funding are way less. There's no question about that. The funding are way less. But I also argue that there are less people that apply for scholarship from those places. I don't know why. That's just the statistics. The funding are higher in sciences, but there are a bunch of science graduates that want to go for master's and PhD. Most of Science people, if you, if at least a large portion of them, rather love to get a job. For others that apply for master, they don't want to become. For those that are really interested in scholarship, want to get to a scholars, there are few of them, but unfortunately, there are also few opportunities. So, what you want to do also, don't scroll through the old pages of your LinkedIn thing I said. You see people on fully funded scholarship in those schools. What type of schools give funding? So, knowing the type of schools, some schools, no, ma no matter how exceptional you are, they don't fund some program. But some schools fund it, some can give you team. So, I think information is power for you guys, knowing where you want to put in your effort. But before putting your efforts, you want to be very, very exceptional and put your best foot forward because you are in a limited field of funding. But is funding available? Yes. Do you have friends that go scholarships? Yes, tons of them in economies, in political science. I have a friend that just got here for a PhD in political science. Got TV, fund, full fund funded offers. You know, you could imagine that political science, right? It's a very good cause, but I know funding is not that much. And what does it do? What did it do, rather? You know, you wrote the GRE funding enough, 
knew what he doesn't need it besides writing. They're like, I want to be exceptional. You know, he had he published about two or three more papers, he applied to a lot of schools, collaborated, just bring himself stand up from his peers. And schools want him to come. And that's just it. How do you become an education USAFP scholar member? Yeah, it's a very good opportunity, competitive, but the first step is you have to have a first class degree. So, no, scratch that, sorry. Education US, anybody can become a member of Education US. Anybody can become a member of Education US, like anyone. So you just want to go to their website, you know, say you want to become a member, once you got prepared, you ask them, and, you can, and it's a very good resource. So they will help you in application processes, they will guide you. However, if you want to be an OFP scholar, it's a segment of Education USA, where they will pay for everything, you're applying, they guide you intensely, then you have to have a first class, then you submit when the application is open, because the application season. You submit, you go for interviews, and what will you submit? If you have a very good CV and you answer some essays questions, go to the present I said, submit the letter of recommendation also, just like basic application for scripts, you definitely get it if you have a very good profile. For those, if the time comes, if you are interested, you can shoot me an email. Uh, I hope I have some time on my hand. I can look at your applications and all these things. But yeah, it's very possible. But even if you don't have a first class, I'll recommend still join the education US as a member, no OFP member. They help a lot. During the application phase, but by doing visa phase also. Like the fact that you're an education residency member helps you in your visa processes. It will be there that you're a member. It makes the embassy know that you've been with the system because it's funded by the embassy. And like they also give you ideas on how to go about it. So education residency is always, always helpful, whether you're a first class or not. And it's something you should go back and look up on what you can do. I think you have to pay to be a member about 15,000, 20,000, but it's a one of payment. And I think you know, it may be a lot, but it's worth it. I don't even address all the questions, but yeah, that was a question. Yeah. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, you can, thanks. Yes, yes sir, you can. Yep. Um, okay. sir, Go ahead. Sir, please, the question I asked initially about building post relationships with your lecturers and professors, like I mean, my second year, so I just need like advice and tips. Oh yeah, sorry I missed that. I'm sorry. And for people that have also have um, misconstrued your questions, I think I didn't answer it. For people to just shine, you know, ask me the replies for that. How do you build relationship? Relationship can be built in various ways. One of the surest ways is excellence. I'm very close to my professors, and I, even till now they still come. And it's excellence. I have a very good expression I did from your first and second year. Do so well in their courses. You know, do whatever they it is they want. And for some of them, based on how they are, yeah, you can approach them. My first connection to a professor is the Dean of State Affairs. And last week, he's a professor of my department. I just walked up to him. I'm like, hey, I love your course. I love what you taught. Uh, you know, I just want some more idea about research. I know in my second year, I don't know anything, but I love to volunteer, have anything. These people are reasonable people. And second is that like, if they're 100 students in school, you know they just did. Maybe two of these, they go and meet them, they're interested in research, they because people just want to come to class, pass and go. And most people hate their lecturers. I can justify why. So it makes sense. Because even like lecturers are not making life easy for people, right? So sometimes. But you just want to be the exceptional one. You want to go and you know, go there, connect with them. Most students are also, but my experience relating with them, that go to lecture offices for one or two days. Is that when they fail or when they need help or when they carry over a course? But here you are, not only did you do well in their course. They don't need to help you. you. You didn't put them in an awkward position. I think what's made my case so strong, I, I became so close to my lecture environment that I usually go out for upgrades or results for my colleagues. And yeah, my score is nice. So they're not, I'm not coming for myself. So I can speak, right? They're like, I get it, but they, I think the example was a miscalculation in the question, sir, can you please? You know, with respect, also know what they want. And, and you know, it's Nigeria now, so I'm a river person, I know we're using it fair. Like, disrespecting is big. Like, they want to be, some of them want to be like, God, treat them like, not like God, God, but like, you know, it's a contestual stuff. Treat them that way. Let them know that they are the alpha and they in the cases where you are, you can, you know, like let them do whatever you can to them. They have knowledge. I won't, I'm not discrediting it. They may not have updated themselves, some of them, but they have knowledge. They have experience that will be helpful to you. The first person that made me realize that I can go from a bachelor's to a PhD was a lecturer in my second year. I was like, can you come? come we are good to work. You can do this. Start with this is my second year. I'm looking at applying for a PhD. Right? And Eventually, I get to know now is everywhere. People know that that is possible. But then it was not, it was not common enough, right? So you can get close to them by being as excellence is your first part, reaching out to some of them. I would also argue 
that some people are just, they are not good people, sorry to use the word. If there are some person you reach out to, they will send you a link. They will treat you like in a piece of shit. It should not be that way. No human should be treated human, irrespective of age or class. But there's nothing you can do about that. But at least you made an attempt. The worst scenario is not making an attempt. But if there's one that I can tell you that I, I don't think it's possible that everybody in your department is like that. If that is the case, and there's a syndrome in the department. I don't think that, 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 that I, I don't think that would, be, that would be the case. So I think that can help reaching out to them and volunteering. Also remember that this not only it doesn't have to be professors. Like you can be assistant lecturer. That is as an that they want promotions. They need all the help they can get. So you're helping them, you know, do stops. They will send you a lot of things. They will send you a malad. They will send you all these things. They will even send you some is on their house. You know, I've watched this for a few of them at times. But yes, I learned some research processes. And you don't see any team work, right? In like you cannot, it's wrong, totally wrong to send your students those things. Like really when you take them to your house, like fan fashion, you have done it. But I learned, you know, the biology lecturer that taught me a lot in biology personally, I did all of that. And uh, I don't regret doing it. Oh my God, I don't regret doing it because I learned a lot from me. We published one work together. Well, he just tells me as if like like a kid, right? You know, and, you know, like a shy thing. If you can write this, probably should be the I know we are, in, we are in Gen Z generation, so it's difficult to understand. But one thing I will don't forget that lecturers are not Gen Z, so yeah, we uh, we can change the narrative when we get to that position, right? As far as the narrative is stands, you can't fight with their power that much. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, sir. No sure there's um, any other we questions. Have, we have another question in the chat box. I said, sir, what you said about the professor writing a recommendation letter for different persons by just editing the name. How do we go about that? Oh, I think I did make the suggestion, right? Because the first thing you want to do is you want to establish a relationship with them, but you also want to always send drafts to them. And like, hey, sir, I know, like, I, you, know, you don't want to make it look as if. They don't have knowledge. That's why you're sending these drafts. Again, knowing the environment matters, knowing the people you are dealing with. Because some people will start they're like, so are you telling me I can never write letters? You want to coin such that so I know you are very, very busy. And you know, I, I really appreciate that you even wanted to do this. In my own spare time, came up with one or two drafts and suggestions that could help you to make it fast and take less time for yourself. And you know, I appreciate it if, uh, if you can just send it to them. Or send, can you ask some of them? Like, just be very, very polite about it. They will most likely use it. Especially for those that you are close to, they will most likely use it. They will just edit it. So it means you can kind of, because when you get to grad school, a grad school application, you won't see what they submit. It's always a, like a back end submission. Or like there's some scholarship that will make you, like she will make you get it from them so you can see. But for most of them, you won't see what they submit. They will just notify you that they submit them. But they, they will likely use it if you have a good relationship with them. And you say, it's just a draft. That's the way you can avoid it generally. Just a draft. All right, thank you so much, Zach. Um, I received a message of right now. Somebody said, Can you please drop your social media handle for us so we can follow you? Um yeah, my name can the ADB, I think, I guess. On can the ADB, right? Yeah, on LinkedIn. On Instagram, okay. I think it should be Yeah, I'll, I'll send that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, all right, sorry. Thank you so much for that. So um, thank you so much for staying with us since the beginning of uh, this particular session to this very moment. Um, we want to especially appreciate our guests like for coming on board. Sorry, I have a question. Okay, um, David, David is raising and David, you can unmute yourself and speak now. Okay. So um, Mr. Kende, thank you so much for the webinar. Really appreciate that. Uh, my question is just about how do we know that a Research topic is actually researchable. A topic is researchable. researchable. Probably you are coming up with a research um, paper. How do you know that this topic you are coming up with is researchable? Thank you so much. Sir. I guess we are moving away from scholarship to research. That's cute. Um, a lot of factors. The first thing are resources around it. I think a lot of any topic can be researched, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe the crafting may not be good, but resources around you. For example, you want to research, you know, the main color of the sun or whatever is inside the sun. That's not possible. Not because it's not a good question, because nobody can go near the sunlight. You don't have a system in which you can travel. The second thing is, so you want to know the resources around you, the validity of the questions. The other thing you can do is, have other people studied this thing before? So reading ahead, I think one thing we don't, we don't train people, researchers in Nigeria to do. We don't train diving deep into nutrition. 
Because I don't know why they want to repeat what somebody else has done. If you want to repeat it, there must be a justification. A typical example, you want to repeat the prevalence of HIV virus. You know, if you go online, you will see it. The only way else will be different if the topic changes to prevalence of HIV virus in Nigeria. Like, it means you put it in an additional factor of in Nigeria. So it means your justification is that, yeah, I know people have done this before, but I'm more specific, but that was at the global stage. This is in Nigeria. Then that is justified. That is researchable, right? You can do that. So, so looking at that, but I think diving deep into the question, knowing that you are not just repeating the same thing. Resources also matters. The resources around you know the question is researchable. And also having a web methodology like, like okay, this is your hypothesis, right? Can, do you have a good method on how to study it? Are the challenges there? You know, it's it's it, it, I can speak for about this for about an hour and give you a stepwise process, but I think your two major metrics should be resources that you have, diving deep into the treasures to see how people have done previous work and seeing what new thing you want to contribute and what is the gap you are trying to fill and what is the justification of your research. I think that's very, very important to do. So it entirely depends on the, on the multiple factors. But yeah, but there's no stupid question to ask. Any question can be asked. You can choose to ask, why is, why is this thing in my head? Why is it pressing my head now? It's, it's researching. Mathematics can start speaking about the topology of things, and the mathematical equation can come. Even though then the only concern is, like, how is that relevant? Who cares? That's a different body metric. But any question can be researched. That's a fact. What can limit it is redundancy is knowledge, resources available to you. And that's why you see I started example of like what you can see. Do. For example, we have Google Forms. We have for those that are scientists, you know, we have some things you can do around that is possible. So look around the resources and can craft your questions in that area. Yeah. Nonetheless, if you have, if you have any question, any research you want to do, and you feel like, oh, you're not sure, you can only send it to me. You can talk about it. That I can give you a more direct question. Like, yeah, if you search able, maybe these right, I mean, the challenges in the case that can be more specific, but there's no one size fits all response to you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, um, I want to believe um, you've already helped us with some your social media angles. So David, just in case you have um, other question on your um, research, you can still reach out to him. He's um, very approachable. So all I'm looking for with you, I can see you raising your hand. You can unmute yourself and I'll speak to Rajan. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Please, can you hear me? Yeah, good evening. You are very portable. So thank you so much, Ms. Martini, for that very insightful presentation. I know we couldn't expect much from you. That's sure. So, okay, I actually want to ask a question first. Okay, which means uh, you gave a very fundamental uh, approach to this, uh, scholarship in general. But I think uh, you do more on graduate school uh, scholarships and all that. But please, can you, maybe in short, maybe a few minutes, because... Like there was a time I was, I think probably you said it or I read it in one of your posts or videos that <laughs> I know that your whole ways of uh approaching scholarship is unique because I think that was the time when you were in your second year, you said we didn't see scholarship coming like as an undergrad. So but you have to, you know, go for it yourself. And so stuff like that. So can you please kindly do a kind of blend with uh undergraduate scholarship? How do we, you know? Go about it because I think many of us are actually curious about that. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'm looking. I don't know what session I shared that, but yeah, that's a very valid story. And maybe I will share the link here. I wrote a book titled right "Nature Based Defense." It's free. It's online. I'll try to share the link here. Even though I'll share it with Peter, he can share it with everyone. In details, oh, I did some stuff in undergrad, and I think and some other scholars who spoke. You will see one or two typos. I think if I write the book when I, I was reading the book most recently and. I was like, oh my God, did I write this in this way? I think I'm on the now. But I wrote this in my undergrad, so. But it's a very, very good book. Now, to answer your question, undergrad scholarship, huh, is Nigeria, so there's always a Nigeria factor. Never forget that. But you can achieve stuff in Nigeria. That's the fact. Obviously, you want to have some good grade, right? You know, have good grade. I had a 5.0 in my first year. There is no reason why I should not get scholarship. And I did not get it. I submitted, I applied, I wrote the exam. At some point, I was even thinking, like, the value that I got was here an illusion. Am I really even intelligent? Because I don't understand how I can get up with in school and I cannot pass as a scholarship exam, even though I didn't see the results. And some of them won't get to, to you, right? So, what I did in my second year, after because I was so poor, like, I don't have any, I knew the, I knew I needed the scholarship. So, the first thing is apply, keep applying to a lot, you know, ask senior people that have helped. That's the first step that I've gotten it. After that, I'll get 
they will tell you, hey, you have to go about it, and you'll get it if you follow it. Because I got this type of scholarship later in my career. But the first scholarship I got was by fixing it the managing director scholarship. What I just did was to write a letter. I sat down, you know, like they say that if, you know, uh, Mohammed is not going to the mountain, the mountain will go to Mohammed. That's what I did. I wrote a letter, a page on the half letter, talking about my academic excellence, saying how much I love academics, speaking a little bit about my challenges, how it's so difficult. But yeah, knowing that I didn't even make my difficulty to disrupt my results and my future interest. A very concise letter, I gave it to one or two persons to read. And I addressed it to about 20 companies in Nigeria, to Nelson, Nessu, to Fitzing, to name it. Like, name all the companies. Well, as far as Ocean Nigeria, but that be, then I go once in a while, like once in a week, because I was in school, right? And I submitted, most of them, you know, the security may not let me enter. Some of them I submitted, they never go back to me. I had sure I submitted about 20 or 25. The key thing was, was it after three months, I got a call from the managing director of Fitzing. I read your letter to me. Can you have, do you have time to read? And I met him and I was like, he's going to pay my school fees. I graduate anything I need. That was my first scholarship. Eventually, I got that scholarship. I got Jaga Foundation. I got Gandhi Farin in my third year. And I got a lot of other scholarships. But that was the first trick I did. But the central goal of undergrad scholarship is good grade. That was mostly the central goal. Obviously, there are scholarships around if you are from this state. So I'm talking about merit based scholarship. Having good grades. Experience matters. Because I knew then when I was applying my first and second year, I was just submitting and maybe writing this essay this way. You would have gotten it before we tell you what to do and what not to do. So that also matters. But one of the things I did was um, doing that innovative approach. And I got a very, you know, very good scholarship that. Also practicing, some of them require interview. Two of those go there without doing mock. Mock interviews are one of the best things ever. Like, you know, what I did during my time when I get interviews for scholarships, I do mock interviews. I asked my colleague to interview me. I interview myself, I record it, I plug into my head, I listen to it over and over again. If it doesn't make sense to me, I record it again, I keep listening to myself. I can do it over a million times. You know, I had a small mirror, then I do it in front of the mirror. So that it becomes a and I don't crown, but like you know, I just have a certain how I want to speak, and it becomes an intrinsic, intrinsic part of how you should sit, how you should talk. Just putting effort, intentionality, effort, commitment, and excellence. And obviously, the most important we should get God grace, right? Yes, that matters. For whatever religion you belong to, those are Christians. I think it's just in God's grace and what is that?